I'll call this regional council meeting to order. Please be advised that tonight's meeting is available for the public to attend virtually, it is being streamed and recorded. Should virtual attendees wish to address council during either the public comment period or the question and answer period, use the raise hands feature on your webinar controls. When it's your turn and are prompted, unmute your microphone, state your name, ask your question, and once your question has ended, you'll be muted again. <clears throat> Are there any council additions? Yes, Mayor, I have one. Very well. Um, the Northern Health, Health Audit Request, um, the Auditor General Request. Thank you, Councillor Gurring. Any CAO additions? No, Mayor. Very well. Can I get a motion, please, to adopt the agenda as amended? Moved by Councillor Penny, seconded by Councillor Roper. All those in favor? Carried. Regional Council minutes of uh, November 22nd, 2021. Special Regional Council of November 22nd, 2021. Can I get a motion, please, to adopt those minutes? Moved by Councillor Soul, seconded by Councillor Roper. All those in favor? Carried. Public comment period. Mr. McIver, is there any public comments? Thank you. Business arising email pool, Northern Lights Festival, grant and aid request for ratification. Can I get a motion, please? Have, Councilor Penny. I'm just going to declare a conflict and leave the room. Okay. Very well, can I ask for a motion, please? Um, Moved by Councillor Soul, seconded by Councillor Roper. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. <laughs> Delegations. Mr. Chris Cooper, the District Manager in Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Mr. Cooper, how are you this evening? I'm good, Mayor Foster. Thank you. Good. We are ready for your presentation. Hold it. All right, so thank you, Mary Foster and, and Regional Council for making time for me today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've come to y'all today, obviously, to, to talk a bit about the Boreal Caribou Protection and Recovery Plan. 
Uh, this is some planning that has been going on for a number of years. I know that we had uh, a public open house probably about three years ago. We're getting pretty close to that. Um, and, and we have been sort of working through the system and through the processes with our partners, uh, including Northern Rockies Regional Municipality ever since. So uh, we've come to a point now to where we, we think we're pretty close to uh, being able to bring some planning documents and some information out to the public uh, and start getting public input on that. And so that's part of the reason why I wanted to uh, do this presentation uh, today. Uh, in addition to the, I understand that there's a, a report that Lisa had uh, provided as part of that planning process that she's been, she's, uh, been involved in. Um, and, uh, and yeah, to, to, uh, to seek essentially endorsement from a Northern Rockies regional municipality to our support to, to go out to public uh, and start engaging on this draft plan. Um, so if we wanna go to the, uh, to the next slide. Sure. No problem. While they're uh, working on the uh, technical piece of the presentation there, I just wanna point out that um, the planning that we've been doing, the province has been doing with Northern Rockies uh, over all this period of time is specific to the four boreal caribou herds that reside within the Fort Nelson district or the Fort Nelson timber supply area, depending on what kind of a, those two boundaries are essentially the same. Um, but yeah, depending on how you wanna think there is a fifth boreal caribou herd uh, that resides to the south of us in the Fort St. John timber supply area. Um, part of the background that I'll, I'll go through today touches on some technical planning that we did around that herd. But what we want to take out to the public at this point in time or, or early next year uh, is just focusing on those four herds within the Fort Nelson district. Well, the picture on the screen right now is what we normally see when we're looking at the It was there. Sure was it. There it is. Yeah, maybe just stick with that rather than the presentation piece. Yeah. So if you could just go back one slide. No, that's good. That's good. So, um, as I said uh, earlier, we're I'm here to request uh, regional council support to to uh, start public engagement, stakeholder and public engagement, on what we are calling draft scenario 3.25, and that 3.25 may make a little bit more sense as I go through this information. Um, but we have this draft scenario, and we would like to take it out to the public. Um, that would also include increasing uh, First Nations engagement. So we have obviously been working with directly with Fort Nelson First Nation all this time. Uh, and we have uh, informed and done a little bit of work in the background with some of the other First Nations, but we need to increase that and, and go into what you would call deep engagement um, with those First Nations, uh, which would include Prophet River First Nation, Dene Ta First Nation, and Acho Dene Quo First Nation that all have overlapping territories with these particular four herds. Are we okay? Do you want me to keep going? or? Go right ahead. Okay. I think we're doing fine. Okay. 
<laughs> um, we have done some industry stakeholder engagement. They, they have had involvement both uh, from the oil and gas sector as well as the forestry sector. Obviously, um, there's been a couple of uh, really strong forestry proponents expressing interest in here. Uh, back in 2018, uh, there was a proponent that was looking at open, reopening the OSB plan, and that intention there was to, to be a partner with Fort Nelson First Nation. So it made sense in the planning process that we're in at that time that we, we consulted with that um, industry proponent to understand fully what their needs were, where their targeted fiber supply would be, and, and see how that would uh, be affected or be incorporated into the caribou planning. Um, that opportunity went away at some point. I'm not sure when it just sort of went, went quiet, but then obviously there has been another very strong component uh, that is active and, and on the books right now. Uh, and they've also uh, had a chance to um, give their input sort of along the way, you know, have a look at um, or able to provide us with information so that we could evaluate what caribou planning under this particular scenario would or would not do. And I'll speak a little bit more around the pellet plant um, later on. Uh, but we would continue to do stakeholder engagement and we need to do some more fulsome uh, stakeholder engagement with regards to oil and gas. Uh, we've done a lot of internal work with both uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mines and the Oil and Gas Commission. Um, but our attention has always been once we had a draft scenario that we could take out to the public, that we would also reach out to CAP uh, and EPAC uh, in order to, to make that uh, oil and gas stakeholder engagement more fulsome. And then obviously we would launch broad public engagement and that can be done through uh, a number of different forums. Uh, for the past year, I've been holding a, what we now call the Northern Rocky Stakeholder uh, Forum or, or table, that's a quarterly forum. Uh, and so I would call a special session or maybe even a couple of special sessions for those guys that attend that. Um, we could go through the Fort Nelson uh, and District Chamber of Commerce. I know there's been uh, a number of different, uh, or that they have provided outlets for different presentations over the years. So I was thinking about approaching them to see if, if that would make sense to set up a, like a virtual type presentation uh, for the public through them. Uh, obviously I can have uh, set up uh, dedicated virtual sessions. I would love to do a public open house, but I don't know if COVID's gonna let me get away with that. So we'll see when we get there, but, uh, but certainly we can do dedicated, uh, a number of dedicated uh, virtual sessions to make sure that folks have enough opportunity to hear and think about this information and be able to provide that feedback to us. Um, with there's also the Northeast Stakeholders Roundtable, which I know is a little bit further south, but we do capture some stakeholders uh, and interested community members through that group um, that are relevant up here. Uh, and I will uh, have it sort of staged through the district office to where we can do sort of a continuous intake once we have been able to provide a fulsome, a fulsome amount of information to the public and they can, they can start uh, thinking about that and putting their minds to it. Uh, I'll have a sort of a portal set up where people can just come to the district office or they can call into the district office and provide that feedback in real time and, and have the opportunity to, to have more conversation about it and ask questions, those kinds of things. Um, and then also engage VC, which is that uh, uh, the province's sort of virtual portal for people to be able to read summaries on, on initiatives like this uh, caribou planning and be able to type in and, and send that feedback directly to, so that we can continue to gather it. Let's go to the next slide. Not yet. So a little bit of background. How, how did we get to where we're at today? Um, so there are, currently there are protections specific to these boreal herds that are already on the land. base, And those protections were established back in 2011 with the boreal caribou implementation plan. But ongoing monitoring and survey work um, that, was, uh, that was done um, after those protections were, were established showed that the populations of these four herds, those, they continued to trend downwards uh, over time. And so uh, hence the need for uh, a renewed planning. At some point um, after 2011, uh, the Federal Species at Risk Act recognized these four herds uh, as being red listed, so endangered, uh, which um, from a federal level put the, uh, 
increased obligation for the jurisdiction of British Columbia to, to plan for these herds in a more stringent way and try to reverse those population trends. So in fall of 2018, the province uh, teamed up with Fort Nelson First Nation and formed a technical team. And the focus of that team was to update the herd core area. So we use those terms a lot when we talk about caribou, we talk about core area where, they're, where the data shows that they spend a majority of their time. And then outside or surrounded by each of those cores is, is a matrix habitat or just a extended range. Um, and that's both recognized by British Columbia as well as Canada. But those things can change over time as, as uh, you know, the populations uh, fluctuate in a, in a particular herd. Um, so we knew that we needed to apply the most updated uh, telemetry data that the, that the province had gathered over the previous years, as well as uh, bringing in the traditional knowledge of Fort Nelson First Nation. Um, and we also were able to incorporate some third party habitat mod modeling, mostly from uh, Ducks Unlimited, who does a lot of uh, habitat suitability modeling, uh, which can be very informative uh, when you're trying to figure out, you know, what, where, where are these caribou herds? Where are they living, traveling, uh, and where are their travel corridors and how are those uh, corridors functioning today? versus the information that the previous 2011 uh, plan was based on. So we updated that information and, and that changed some line work a little bit. It gave us some, so a little bit different look at where these four caribou herds are really concentrating at the moment. Um, and so we updated that uh, line work and that also allowed that technical team to, to draft some scenarios based on that line. And so those draft scenarios, actually, let's not go back. Yeah, let's go back a couple of slides. Go keep going up. Yeah, stay on the background there. That's perfect. Not a little too far. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, and so those initial four scenarios that were just based on the, on the technical line work, the updated technical line work, we were anywhere from sort of status quo, kind of where we're at right now, um, all the way up to pretty much total protection uh, of, the, of the herd ranges. So not just the cores, but the herd ranges as well, that matrix habitat. Um, so that kind of just give us a, gave us a starting point. This was around sort of early 2019. And, and as I'm sure everybody remembers, there was another caribou planning process that was going on. It was getting a lot of attention in the news that had absolutely nothing to do with boreal caribou planning, totally separate process. Um, but we learned pretty quickly that um, just sticking with uh, the province and Fort Nelson First Nation wouldn't be as a fulsome uh, a planning team and would probably uh, would not get us where we needed to be um, just based on what we were seeing down south. And so at that point, we, we came to the agreement to bring the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality through some representation uh, as the choice of, of Northern Rockies. Um, to join that team as we were moving from a technical planning phase into a strategic planning phase. And so we formed this strategic planning committee between the province for Nelson First Nation and Northern Rockies. And over the course of 2019 and 2020, um, that committee worked to evaluate the initial draft scenarios. We started making tweaks. Uh, we devised some additional scenarios. We had that we, uh, uh, devised essentially what was called a scenario five, which was just a little bit different uh, look at targeted areas within the, within the timber harvesting land base. Um, we continued to make revisions, additions, deletions, uh, most of it based around tar targeting um, the economic fiber supply based on the interest that we were seeing at that point in time, as well as being able to maximize the, the most effective protections that we could put in place for these particular herds to, to reverse those declining trends. Um, there was industry stakeholder input, uh, again, both from an oil and gas and the forestry perspective during uh, those, those two years of work that we did. Um, and we also commissioned some pretty intensive forestry sector modeling where we were drilling down to, and we, so we went through uh, industrial forestry services out of Prince George uh, to do this work and really drill down to the stand volumes, the leading species, 
and the cycles, cycle times um, to really try to get a, a more of a delivered log cost and see how forestry and investment opportunities could be viable under, under the scenarios that we have. Um, as we worked through that work, we got into late uh, 2020, early uh, sort of January 2021. Um, and there was a lot of interest with this pellet plant that, you know, there's, and it's still a lot of interest uh, around that pellet plant opportunity. Um, Fort Nelson First Nation uh, was getting pretty close. They had been working for a couple of years on their own on, on their land stewardship framework. Uh, which from my understanding, I have not seen the framework, but uh, from my understanding, it's, it's essentially addressing all of their values and concerns and how those uh, values could or could not be overlapped with, um, uh, with industrial development in the future. And so in January, Fort Nelson First Nation asked uh, the committee, the three parties, if they could have some time to finish their land stewardship uh, framework and really apply that framework or overlap that framework with the caribou planning that we were doing to see how that would or would not necessarily align with some of the other goals that Fort Nelson would like to, to achieve on the land base. And so we, uh, we did, we, we agreed to say, well, okay, we'll, we'll give you the time. Um, it did take longer than what uh, I think anybody expected. Took, it certainly took longer to get there than what Fort Nelson had intended. Uh, but about October, uh, of this year, Fort Nelson First Nation came back to the province uh, and they had proposed what they were calling scenario 3.5, which was based on of an overlap of their land search framework, as well as the forestry needs that they were working in conjunction with uh, the, the interested proponent peak renewables uh, at that point in time to make sure that that um, opportunity could be viable. Um, the province, we, we looked at uh, scenario 3.5 and we realized that uh, it, was, it looked really good, um, but there were some, there was some request through that scenario that Fort Nelson had drafted um, to, to apply some protections that fell outside of those caribou core areas and even the major plains areas. So essentially they were asking to um, through this particular scenario to, to apply some protections on the land base that we couldn't rationalize as um, adding incremental protection to any one of those four caribou herds. It was, it was in the in-between space. So it was sort of creating some, some islands of potential protection. Um, and so while we recognize that, that Fort Nelson First Nation uh, do want to pursue uh, additional protections on the land base in accordance with their cultural uh, values, we need the caribou scenario to be 100% uh, protective of those caribou herds. And so we in the province made some adjustments to Fort Nelson's scenario 3.5 and brought it back to them for their consideration uh, they understood and they agreed with this. And so at that point, uh, we had what we were calling scenario 3.25. Um, and we, as obviously during this last sort of stage, um, that review of scenario 3.5 and, and the province's changes that it needed to see be made, uh, that was not done directly in, um, uh, in conjunction with the Northern Rockies, with the representatives from Northern Rockies. Uh, but we were then able to uh, provide scenario 3.25 to that team and give them the time to, to do their own evaluation of that and then, and then come back to us and, and tell us what they thought. Um, and so after that happened, um, we agreed within the committee that uh, it would make sense to bring this forward to our respective parties. So Fort Nelson First Nation has gone to their chief of council uh, to seek support. And I have gone to our Caribou Program Board also to seek support for public engagement on scenario 3.25, which is a totally a draft scenario. <laughs> the intention is to continue to revise and tweak and adjust the scenario based on the public and stakeholder feedback that we get. But we've got to, we've got to get it out there in front of us first. So if we go to the next slide, to show you a quick map of scenario 3.25. And I, I know there is, there's a ton of information on this map and it is very difficult to understand. And my intention is to 
uh, actually build a layered map to where I can pull and push layers. So it'll make it a little bit easier for people to visualize what's going on when we do get out in front of the public. Uh, but for right now, this is what I've got. And all the all the grid lines that you're seeing on there and the polygons with the dots in the middle of them, those are the existing protections um, from the 2011 plan. And you can see from there, well, actually, I'll explain the colors first. <coughs> uh, the green, the yellow, and the little bit of light blue that you see scattered throughout there, those, those are the protection areas. So those are the areas that we want to see protected, uh, potentially protected um, for these four carib caribou herds. And you'll see that those existing protections, they do largely overlap the green, yellow, and blue, but not everywhere. You'll see some of those existing protections overlapping the beige or brown area, as well as that pink or fuchsia. I'm not sure what color you would call that. The beige and the pink, that's where, uh, that's an area that would be open to industrial development. So uh, the be area that we would not protect uh, under this particular scenario, which means some of those existing protections need to be adjusted. And that makes sense because as we said, the updated uh, survey data that we had from 2000 or since that we've been collecting since 2011 have shown us that those protections may not actually be exactly in the right place. So there would be some tweaking of those existing protections to align with the, the green, the yellow, and the blue. The reason why there's so many different colors on this map is uh, because there are different management intents with regards to the existing oil and gas infrastructure that's up there. So the green areas would be completely off limits to anything including oil and gas. So the reason why we can say that is because in, within the green areas, there's not a lot of current oil and gas obligations. So there's not a lot of active tenures uh, for oil and gas. There's not a lot of obligations that they need to take care of. Um, and so we were able to say under the green, we can protect that 100%. The yellow, um, there is a significant amount of, of active what uh, oil and gas refer to as unconventional tenure. And so under the yellow, uh, we're looking at areas that we could see a return of oil and gas uh, industrial development in the future. Obviously, you know, the markets have to change, gas prices have to come back up significantly, but that we could get to that point. And because within those yellow areas, the unconventional tenures that are already tenured, uh, there's not an opportunity currently for, for um, the Oil and Gas Commission or Energy and Mines to buy those tenures uh, back. So if we do see um, oil and gas come back sometime in the future, we would see it within those yellow areas because the indication is they won't come back for conventional tenures. They need the directional drilling unconventional tenures to, to go after. Um, but the agreement is that if it does come back at some point, while we can't protect those areas in the yellow, we can apply uh, fairly high offsetting ratios that'll see any new uh, service disturbance from oil and gas activities actually continue to um, create a positive trend for the recovery of the habitat. Because for every kilometer of disturbance that a pipeline makes, they have to restore 10 kilometers. So sort of like a 10 to one offset ratio. So that's mm -hmm. something for the future. And then the blue are uh, obligations by existing oil and gas companies where restoration needs to happen. So there's dormant site wells, there's legacy uh, reclamation program through, through the Oil and Gas Commission, um, and as well as other obligations. And so we can't cut off access to those little bit of blue areas. Oil and gas need, companies need to get in there. They need to fulfill their obligations. Sometimes that results when you restore an area, you have to disturb some area in order to get that. And so that's why there's those three different colors. There. The pink are areas that we had wanted to protect and you would see them in protections under a scenario one or scenario two. But as we realized that we needed to free up more targeted fiber supply for the viability of the forestry sector, we started um, identifying these areas in pink as really high, uh, good access to that, uh, to the fiber that is needed out there. 
even though we would like to protect them, we need to make those viable. And so that's where you see the difference in where we change something into the pink color that just shows us, the, the planning team, that that was previously intended for protection and now we open that up for, uh, for industrial development. So if we go to the next slide. So implications from scenario 3.25 is to increase the total amount of area protected across these four herds by about 1.7 million hectares. Currently, there's just under 800,000 hectares that are protected specific to caribou, these caribou herds. And that represents about 21% of the total four herd ranges all averaged together. We want to increase that to just under 2.5 million hectares, which would represent 67% of those four herd ranges um, being protected. But when we look at the core habitats, which is really where the most amount of time these herds, these animals are spending their time, we're attaining 78 to 100% protection of those core areas. That puts us, based on um, the federal government's uh, assessments, that puts these four herds anywhere between a moderate to a high likelihood uh, of achieving a population self-sustainability over time. And the reason why there's a difference is a herd like uh, Westside Fort Nelson or Max Hamish, are, their ranges are hitting like around 63 to 65% protected, whereas Herd ranges like say snake satane and calendar are up in like the 80 to 90 percent of those areas being protected. So that's why there's there's some difference between across those four herds. Uh, scenario 3.25 ensures targeted economic fiber supply to support the forest sector investment. And it also ensures access to existing oil and gas liabilities and, and obligations. Go to the next slide. From an impact, uh, some of the industrial impact uh, perspective in forestry, uh, scenario 3.25 will reduce the timber harvesting land base by around 24%. So re reducing it, we're a little over 800,000 hectares right now, it'll reduce it down to about 661,000 hectares, which would equate into around a 16% reduction in the allowable annual cut. So we're currently at, 2.5 uh, million and change, we would reduce that to about 2.2 million cubic meters. That does not include the community forest. So the community forest volume is incremental to the allowable annual cut for this timber supply area. So all in all, when you add all that together, we are at 2.3, 2.4 million cubic meters available under this scenario. So that's after we apply the protections. For petroleum and natural gas management, uh, they will align their actions with the surface restrictions for forestry. So they will, with the exception of taking care of their, their liabilities and obligations, will not um, tenure new activity under the same areas that is, intent, that is being protected from uh, future forestry development. Uh, so no new surface development <coughs> activities in these designated areas. Um, and an increase in restoration activities for their obligated and non-obligated sites. Um, applying these protections gives us uh, an additional advantage that we don't talk often about, but there is a ton of investment and future investment slated for restoration of the land, healing of the land. Base. One concern is that you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars restoring a site, and if that site's not protected, some other industry from some of their ministry could come in there and tear that up. When you uh, have these large amounts of land base protected under a particular plan like this, it gives that security of investment. So when you're restoring disturbed land within a protected area under the scenario, that restoration investment gets protected as well because it keeps other industries uh, out or puts under other industries in areas where we're not investing in restoration. Um, and as I said before, uh, if PNG interest in PNG extraction resumes in this re region at some point, um, the intention is that they will, uh, those agencies will apply an offsetting regime that will result in new service disturbance or will result in a positive habitat trend because of the level of restoration that would be required by those companies. 
And then I think we are almost on the next to last slide here. Oh yeah, just right quick. Um, other support tools that go along with this, um, this uh, protection is uh, offsetting ratios for PNG, as well as uh, you know, really stringent uh, forestry planning, looking at critical features, enhancing silviculture, and uh, adhering forestry operations to Port Nelson's land management framework. I say that in the sense that the intention is for any forestry proponent to be a partner with Port Nelson First Nation. And so our expectation would be that that partnership would uh, essentially enforce uh, a level of that land management or land stewardship framework. Um, predator management, we've always talked about predator management. I will be honest with you guys, predator management in the boreal plain is nothing like it is in the alpine regions, um, but it can be done and we are exploring uh, with Fort Nelson and other First Nations about some, some options uh, that would make sense and be effective from a predator uh, management perspective. And then as I mentioned uh, before, there's a lot of restoration, there's a lot of investment uh, in restoration going on and coming our way. And so uh, having those areas protected, uh, Fort Nelson First Nation has done a lot of work over the years and continues to do ongoing restoration projects. Um, but there is a committee that is targeting, targeting legacy PNG sites, so these are like seismic lines that nobody owns anymore, and so, but they need to be restored. Um, once we do get land, uh, a recovery scenario, uh, we will then be in a good position, uh, position to start negotiating what we call a Section 11 of the Species at Risk Act with the federal government. And that Section 11 will access additional funds um, that will probably be more, well, certainly we will negotiate to push for more of that particular type of funding to be geared towards capacity building. Because you can have all the money set aside for the actual restoration <coughs> activities, but if nobody's, nobody's here to do it, and there's not enough people that, that can get on the land base, enough equipment, enough technical ability, and we realize that capacity needs to be built back up up here. And so that is uh, a high priority on our mind in addition to the dollars that would go to boots on the ground, uh, restoration activities. And then we'll always work with other First Nations and local communities. There's always a number of different programs uh, that, are, that can uh, be geared towards different aspects of, of restoration. Uh, so now well, let's go to the next last slide. Um, we do need to complete a socioeconomic assessment. Um, I know that Northern Rockies did one um, uh, a few years ago uh, that gave a lot of information. Um, the government needs to, to do, uh, run a socioeconomic assessment and then have a third party uh, review that, realizing that um, it's, it, would, it is largely based on uh, potential opportunity because we don't have an active forest industry. We don't have a, a really active oil and gas industry. So it's, uh, it's a little bit different approach when we look at a socioeconomic assessment rather than just saying, if we reduce the timber harvesting land base, you're gonna see this level of reduction in jobs. We don't have that situation here. So we gotta look at what, what are we doing to a potential opportunity uh, for any industry. Um, we are having ongoing briefings with different uh, ministers, RMI minister, as well as Energy and Mines, uh, Ministry of Environment and Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Um, we do have some ongoing talks going on with uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the federal government uh, arm of this, um, but they are anxious to, to see us, uh, to see what the public thinks about this and to see what kind of feedback we get. So we will continue to, to work with ECCC, uh, other First Nations, public and stakeholders. We'll use that feedback, as I said earlier, to continue to revise and tweak and adjust this scenario and refine it. And we will produce some what we heard reports from the public so that the public can see that we, we're hearing what they're saying and, and they can see uh, what the broader feedback is uh, across the public. As we move towards um, finalizing a scenario and going to the province to seek endorsement for that final scenario, which would allow us to then start the process of, of enacting these protections. So with that, I'll stop and see if anybody's got any questions. Councilors, any questions for Mr. Cooper? Councilor Gerwing. 
Um, so you spoke about predator management, um, and I'm wondering if you have engaged with any of the people that are unofficially currently doing yeah. that. Our, our trappers and trap line holders. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. A, a little bit. Not you. Know, that needs to be more wholesome. We need to. We need to build a program that that will make sense um, that we can then seek funding for. Uh, and so we're really talking about a ground based. Uh, predator management, which which is difficult, and I think even the guys that are out there doing it will tell you that it's it's really hard to to make it economical. Um, so you know maybe we're looking at uh, a ground program that's supported by some level of, of aerial aerial support in some way, whether that's you know collaring or tracking or, or that type of thing. So, so but that's something we need to get. Be is why wouldn't you have done that and and included? at least a draft plan in this report? Why would that be coming after? Well, a couple of different reasons. Your resources are always tight and, and the folks that we need to focus on that are the same folks that are that are in the air, air doing the clutter management programs for Southern Mountain Caribou and Central Mountain uh, Caribou. So there is a level where, and where we're gonna need to pull from those resources and that uh, you know, there's not many people that can that can actually do that work, be the technical experts, and actually be out there doing that work. Um, so we're going to have to figure out the resourcing uh, issue around that in order to be able to plan it. And the other piece is that the federal government uh, has been very animate that they want to see the recovery plan, the the land based protections take top priority. If we were to focus our resources and time and effort on uh, the development of predator management and the implementation of predator management for these boreal herds at this point, um, that would not, I guess, sort of sit well with the federal government. They want to see protections first and then population support tools come in and be planned behind that. Uh, that's, so that's an interesting way of looking at it, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're feeling that the protection of the land is their that's what they want to see because yeah. that's what they believe is best for the caribou yeah. or so mm -hmm. is that based in research then yeah. in terms of because there's some people that will quote the research on predator management is much more effective in protection protecting the caribou so i'm just wondering so the the reason for you're absolutely right uh and the reason for that is the predator management is it, it is a way more effective tool in the very short term but the day that you stop predator management is the day those predators start rebounding. Habitat protection in a way that it can be restored and be allowed to, uh, to restore itself over time and not continue to be disturbed in other areas, that's the long-term goal. That allows those herds to eventually be able to self-sustain their populations without predator management. So the, the protection and the growth of the habitat, the, the restoration of the habitat, gets you to a point to where you don't have to do predator management for, for all time. And so that's why the focus on the planning piece is to get that in place first, and then we can start figuring out how we address these other population support tools. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Cooper? Can you outline for us the population of the four herds that you mentioned, the uh, West Side, Fort Nelson, McSamish calendar, and there was one other one? Mm, I am not the technical expert, and I noticed that uh, Michael Huck was not able to join me today. So, um, oh, is he? Ah, right. Yeah, Michael, uh, you might be able to answer the what the herd herd population levels are at? Are at. Well. There he is. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you asked for the population estimates of those yes. four herds. So I guess I'll, I'll give a little preamble here. Um, boreal caribou are pretty notoriously difficult to count. Um, 
So we rely upon a couple different metrics when we are talking about the population. Um, and for these herds, um, we have what we call population lambdas, which is um, a metric that we use to determine whether or not the populations are growing or declining. And then estimates themselves, um, sometimes those are made for entire herd range, um, but we don't have those for all herds. I'm just pulling up <clears throat> um, I didn't have this, these numbers. I don't have them off the top of my head, so I'd have to pull up a document here. You bear with me. Okay, um, so yeah, I have caribou population growth rates um, for the period of 2013 to present. Um, I'm not able to share my screen by chance. <laughs> yeah, you better, you better just describe it. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so in the calendar herd, which is the Northeast, um, that's a transboundary herd with Northwest Territories and Alberta, uh, the populations are have increased um, recently. Um, the Chinchaga herd, which is not part of this planning process, uh, but resides in the Fort St. John timber supply area, it was in the Peace Natural Resource District. Um, it's continually declining. Um, we've been doing predator management in this area the last two years, and we've noticed a slight uptick in recruitment. Um, so that population is stabilizing, but again, the long-term um, trend has been a decline. The Max Hamish herd, which is in Fort Nelson, um, this herd again has been declining, um, but in recent years, there has been some stabilization. Um, so we're seeing that the caribou numbers aren't uh, decreasing to a great extent. Um, in the snake satine, um, we've seen that the numbers uh, go from declining to slightly increasing recently. Um, and then the west side of Fort Nelson, we've been seeing continued declines. I think the current population estimate for west side Fort Nelson, um, well, we actually were just doing a survey there uh, this last week and we saw 60 caribou, so that's a minimum count. Um, and then the Chinchaga, the number is about 150. The calendar is looks like to be about um, a minimum count of around 75. And the Max Hamish looks to be about 100. But what I can do is commit to sharing with council um, these most recent reports um, that synthesizes this. And this is obviously going to be a major aspect of public engagement is to tell this story and we'll have those kind of numbers in a more polished, presentable fashion format. Thank you, Mr. Huck. I guess, you know, when I hear that the government, particularly the federal government says these are a species at risk and, um, you know, in danger of extinction. And then I hear that they really don't have any hard numbers on how many there are. I wonder how they came to the conclusion that they were, um, in, in such dire straits. And I'm not disputing that maybe they are, but I find that the science is a little bit, uh, a little bit fuzzy here when, when they say that there is a certain condition, but they don't have any hard numbers for it. So I look forward to those numbers. Um, and I'm encouraged that some of these numbers are going up, um, despite the fact that uh, I guess not, not much has been done to the herds uh, lately to increase them. So I don't think there's been very much in the way of predator protection or other than just the trapping that usually goes on. So I'm a little encouraged that those numbers are going up. Um, are there any other comments from any councillors? Very well. 
Thank you very much then, Mr. Hawk, Mr. Cooper. Appreciate you Thanks, coming. Um, did you need a motion then from council to uh, endorse your in public engagement? That, that would be ideal. Very well, I'll make that motion. Is there a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Councillor Souls. All those in favor? Oh, Councillor Gerwing, you had some comment? Well, I'm just wondering if we could get some before we, um, well, there's a motion on the floor, so sorry, but I'm just wondering if we could get some input from staff before, because we, we kind of had a one-sided presentation. It's the first I've seen of it. Did, did it. I don't know whether it came earlier and I missed it, but um, first time I've seen it, so. Very well. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any uh, problem with drawing that motion, and maybe we will get some uh, staff comment on this, Mr. Barry. Uh, we. Uh, I can kind of defer to Lisa a little bit here. In the. <laughs> well. <laughs> we were back. We were back and forth. Yeah. Thanks for that. We were, <laughs> We were back and forth in terms of due process here in terms of what we're going to do. So um, we uh, never had a whole lot of information originally besides a conversation that staff did have with Chris and the group and the First Nations. So the intent tonight was for Chris to be able to present the findings and what the thoughts were in terms of process. Um, we can absolutely bring some information back for council to in terms of what um, in terms of what the process that we've uh, experienced in and, and some thoughts regarding that. My understanding from discussions with um, Lisa is that the staff that were involved, which was yourself and Mike, Mike and Doug, um, did support the version 3.25 uh, from what they saw, because at the end of the day, it's about getting the engagement, as Chris said, it's about bringing it to the public to get the feedback in the various, you know, between industry, public and whatnot to determine if changes might need to be made or not made. Um, so it's not about endorsing, I guess, the plan to say they support it wholeheartedly. It's the support to, um, to support the actual engage, engagement of the public for the document, essentially. But that said, we can absolutely bring something back for council for your review. Councilor Gerwin. So I found it interesting that um, there won't be a socioeconomic study done on what this report like tied to this report, like what that's going to look like that that hasn't been done yet. So did you, when you go out to the public, how do we go out to the public with not knowing? Because when we did our socioeconomic um, study on, I think it was a previous plan, it was pretty scathing as to mm -hmm. what it could look like. So I'm sitting here now, first time seeing this report, and I'm wondering, so what is the socioeconomic um, reality if this plan were to go ahead? Like, I understand that we're just asking for us to approve to go out to the public. But if I was attending as a public person, I would want to know, well, what's the socioeconomic? Yeah, no, so uh, great question and concern. Uh, so the intention is to have that socioeconomic study or assessment done on scenario 3.25 knowing that that is the scenario that we would be we'd have support to go to take out to the public so we'll do that assessment on that scenario before we as part of the information package that will go out to to the public we could do it now but if i don't have support to go out to the public am i wasting my resource at that point or should i get support and then do the social economic so I guess my issue is if you're asking for our support to go out to the public, I'd, I mean, public engagement is always good. But if you're asking for our support for scenario 3.5, then we yeah. definitely need to go back to our staff to get some information on that. So yeah, now I'm, I, we're not asking for uh, the regional council's endorsement of the draft scenario. Okay. We're just asking for support to put it out to the public and see what feedback we get. And then adjust for that. And would that, when you went to the public, would that be 
that would not be including then the socioeconomic. No, it impact. will. So I'll so we can do that. And and Mike, I think you had. I know that you were getting that lined up. Do you want to be able to speak to the timelines on that, please? Yeah, I can. So um, one of the trickies with with the socioeconomic assessment here is that we're talking about opportunity cost loss. Um, so we've been using metrics such as timber harvesting land base and impacts to that to be able to inform uh, the, the level of acceptable trade-offs between effective habitat protection, as well as ensuring that there's enough access to the forest to support investment in the Fort Nelson Natural Resource District. So um, we've been using those core scale metrics, um, but that doesn't convert those um, into uh, things like jobs, government rents, and those other um, indirect effects. Um, so we've currently got the scenario, um, the fiber supply analysis completed, and then that's what the economists need to be able to develop these secondary multipliers. And we can have that um, soon. Um, it's, in the, it's in the works to be done right now. Um, and then from the petroleum and natural gas side, uh, our partners at Energy and Mines are also doing internal assessments to speak to what these implications are. And that'll form part of the engagement. Um, but we need to be able to engage with industry stakeholders to really ensure that those numbers um, make sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I think the uh, attitude of council here is that we're going to consult with our uh, administration here before we endorse anything, and then uh, we will take a vote on that at a later date, unless somebody has any objections. Councillor Penny. I'm just thinking about time of the year and our meeting right now. By the time we get this back, um, is this something we're going to take care of then in a special meeting the next week or so. I, I, I don't want to hold this up any further. And I can just imagine trying to decide a social impact of uh, any closures. I mean, really, for the last 13 years, every area could have been closed and it wouldn't have had that much effect because nobody's there. So I, I appreciate how difficult it is to try to figure out the effects of, of closing these areas. And it sounds like you guys have been uh, doing a great job, but I don't, don't want to delay this getting out to the public any longer than we have to. So I'd hope that we could get back to it soon very well perhaps a special meeting then yeah we can pull something together thank you thank you and thank you, thank you, and thank you mr hawk and mr cooper for your presentation today Administration report number 83, supporting schools with green waste diversion. For discussion, Ms. Shepard. Hi, Mayor and Council. So this report comes back um, in follow up to Council's request that staff explore options to support schools and green waste diversion initiatives back in October. Um, as you know, back when the Vermicompost project first launched, NRM staff engaged in presentations around the community to try and educate about the project at the landfill. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's been some excitement at the school level in recognizing the importance of sustainability and the opportunity for valuable teaching moments over the time of the vermicompost. Um, of course, you're familiar with the, the request from Carlson School in 2019 to implement a green bin there. Um, without a municipal program in place, SD81 has implemented some of their own sustainable processes such as diverting paper and cardboard waste. Um, and then some staff at the schools have inquired about other ways that they can further their involvement. Um, we did eight presentations at Angus in September and um, 
Angus has recently established a green club. There's been interest inquiries from the Strong Start Family Programming at, um, at the schools as well. Um, so as you know, while green waste diversion is voluntary in the NRM right now, there are financial, economic and social benefits to the municipality for broadened participation. Um, just such as reducing the volume of waste entering the landfill, which in turn decreases the prevalence of pollutants and the chances of contamination and thereby extending the landfill's health and lifespan. Um, in understanding how to best support schools with furthering their green waste diversion programs, I think it's important to understand that there are various processes by which an organization might engage in that process. So currently, as you know, you can um, contract a commercial green waste disposal bin, you can hire a local green waste pickup service, and then of course people can drop off at the transfer station free of charge. So each option has customizable processes uh, to meet the needs of the organization that's used, utilizing the services. Um, there are logistical considerations associated with storing and collecting organic waste. There are some allergens that some people have said might determine how they, what process they engage in um, without knowing the exact volume of waste to be expected. It's kind of difficult both on the level of the people wanting the service and the people providing the service to know what uh, option would be best. Um, and then it's difficult to get an accurate understanding of the costs that might be associated with that without knowing the volume of waste at this time. Uh, because of that, and because organizations are implementing services according to their site and their specific needs, um, developing a green waste diversion program should be tailored specific to that organization undergoing the transition. So there are a few options outlined for council to consider in supporting SD81 with implementing green, green waste diversion programs. Um, Council may wish to provide a one-time or annual grant. Funds could be allocated to specific environmental clubs to support implementing green waste diversion programs or a transition to that. Or costs, costs for green bin tipping fees or organic waste collection services could be subsidized um, for discussion. Thank you. Councillor Gerwing, I believe this is your portfolio. Any comments? Yeah, what a great report as always. Um, thank you very much. Um, I really liked um, the point um, for the highest likelihood of success implementing green waste diversion should be tailored specific to the needs, capacity and engagement of the organization. The hospital is also very interested in moving forward with a green waste um, plan. So yeah, I'm very much in support of whatever each school needs. And I think it's going to look different for each school. Um, and I would like to see us move forward this school year so that we don't lose another year. We had a great project um, at Carlson School, but since that we've had COVID and now we have a new waste management um, pickup service in our community. So, um, that might depend on, that might influence how different schools are participating. I would like to have a conversation um, at the council table. Are we speaking about green waste only? Because currently it's my understanding that school district 81 is taking care of all the paper and cardboard from all of the schools. And when we were operating our pilot project at Carlson, we allowed the paper and cardboard to go in the green bin. So I don't know whether we would be entertaining that notion again, or are we simply wanting to subsidize the um, green waste diversion? Or is it maybe going to be flexible for different schools or different organizations? like? Ms. Shepard, any comments? Um, yeah, so SD81 does have a process in place for diverting their paper and cardboard waste. It is my understanding that when the bin was established at Carlson that um, 
it could house all the cardboard and organics um, and paper. Uh, that would be up to council's discretion. And just, um, I guess, in noting that in other municipalities, the waste collection services maybe wouldn't be subsidized, particular to school district or organization. But I guess that's the difference in this new initiative and in having a green waste diversion project that we're trying to get buy-in for and uh, promote community engagement on. So yeah, it's up to council to decide um, how that rolls out. Do you have a feeling um, from the schools about, are they good to keep going with their cardboard paper diversion as it stands now and interested in um, green waste diversion only? Do you know what you're feeling on that? Um, I think I can see that the green bin that was established at Carlson back in 2019, having be able to take all kinds of green waste was um, efficient and helpful. I think that there would be challenges for that moving into um, the summer season with wildlife and the frequency of tipping. Um, and again, I do think that needs are different according to the sites and, um, and the amount of waste <laughs> being produced. So um, also depending on the, uh, maybe what you'd call the green coordinator at the school or how much uh, involvement there might be at a school level. If there's a champion for the initiative, you may have more desire to have a program where the kids are more involved as in having uh, the, the pickup service where the kids are involved in the daily sort of operation as opposed to um, the custodial staff taking the bin and, and tossing it at the end of the night. Right. So kind of where I'm headed, and I don't know how the rest of the council feels and definitely open to your input, but um, where I'm headed is that I would like to keep it um, as flexible as possible for each site. And so maybe subsidizing the cost of green bin tipping fees for all or selected schools according to the needs and budgetary constraints. So let the school figure out whether they're going to use the, the private pickup green bin or whether they want to have uh, um, a, a larger bin without using any names, I'm trying to figure out, you know. Anyways, so I'd like to keep it a bit more flexible. So if a school decides that they want the bigger bin, then we can maybe, you know, subsidize some of that. But if they're more interested in getting the smaller, um, more portable green bins, then, but then that will, um, create more planning for our staff. And I don't know that we have the capacity to do that or not, so. Any other comments? Councillor Penny. I'm very much in favor of this, but just unable to decide what looks best to go forward without you know, each individual school, like you said, giving us the feedback and, and make a decision at that point. Um, I see that we have $4,500 remaining from the funds that were allocated. How much were allocated? Was it, was that the contained amount, you know, or I don't remember, I don't recall. What Mr. Bear, the shepherd. My understanding is that um, uh, I think funds were moved into the, were allocated here from the disbanding of the, uh, maybe, there was a donation from the um, oh, no. Social Planning Society when it was disbanded um, because yes. that the funds originally came from Encana and they were to be used towards um, waste diversion. So we were doing the pop cans and everything, right? So we were keeping all of that out of the landfill. So then those of us that were left for the Social Planning Society thought that this um, was a diversion plan that fit with the original grant application to Encana, but I forget what that amount was. Right, so I think that might've been around 8,000. And then I think what happened is that the money was allocated to promoting public engagement with vermicomposting in the first year. And then maybe in the second year, it was topped up again, I think to 10,000 uh, over 2021. 
95. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I mean, I just wonder what, what, you know, how much you're spending or whatever, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm very much in favor. I, I want to see us take part in, but I, I'd like to know what we're going to take part in. What, what do they feel is best for each school, whatever way it's going to get it moving forward. So then what I'm hearing you say, and I guess Mr. Barry might be able to answer. So you'd like more of a plan that, um, Angus School is going to do this, and the municipality <coughs> is going to contribute this cost, and FNSS is going to do this, and we're going to contribute this cost. Is that kind of what you're thinking about? Yeah, because it's difficult. If we were to say, okay, we're going to we're going to cover fifty percent of the costs. Yeah. Well, you know, are they going to hire twenty people to go around and, and and pick it all up, or are they just going to have one bin in the yard? It's you know, I can't I can't just arbitrarily come up with a, a figure. So, so then would we have staff capacity to help school district 81 to come up with these plans or do you? It depends, I guess, on what that plan would look like or what the school who works required. So it's probably best to broach the discussions with the schools and figure out what their ideas and thoughts are. And then from there, we can determine um, what, because because really at this point, I'm not sure if we really know what, what scope of work we were required and I'll let you kind of speak to that. Uh. Yeah, so I have had uh, conversations with both uh, staff at the school board office and at um, all of the schools actually. And so there are people in, in each school that want to see the initiative take place and they are looking for support. Um, I think I think that they have ideas about how they would go roll out within their own schools. And um, yeah, I'm not sure that it, the understanding that I have is that they could, they could carry out their processes in the absence of there being a municipal program. They have been um, very proactive on the environmental and sustainability front. So um, from my conversations, they're very eager uh, to kick off a program and to implement something, they might just be lacking a bit of funding to um, to get that started. So uh, it does seem like there are people at each school ready and willing to um, to drive that forward. <laughs> so um, on item number two, allocate funds to each school to support environmental clubs with a focus on green waste diversion efforts. Um, if we are tailoring this to each individual school, um, maybe, that's, maybe that's a way for this conversation to happen to see what their ideas are of funding that they would require to achieve their goals um, in, in the environmental file, I guess. So um, I'd, I'd like to see us engage with the schools. I also would like to congratulate the Green Club of the RL Angus for uh, you know, starting this club and uh, and being proactive in getting uh, getting involved in environmental issues. So, um, I guess I'm looking for a motion here to instruct staff to engage with School District 81 um, to see what sort of uh, green initiatives they would like and what sort of support that the municipality can give them. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Councillor Gerwing. Uh, Ms. Shepard, how long would it take to accomplish this? Engage with School District 81? Um, just in, in that it's the holiday season, I, um, I can get in touch with my contacts and hope to have something back to Council at the January meeting, <laughs> I, I suppose, or do we have two? We won't do we have two? Do we have two meetings in January, Mr. Barry? Yes, we do. Yeah. How about the second meeting in January? We'll, we'll bring. We can bring something back for sure. Council, whatever. Basically, an update depending on where we are. Okay. Uh, the second meeting in January. All those in favor, please. Uh, did uh, Councillor uh, Andrews leave us? Yeah, Councillor Andrews had to leave. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Shepherd, for that. Administration report number 84, I'm sorry, uh, 80, yes, 84, Parks and Community Facilities Bylaw Update. Ms. Aspen. 
Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we bring this report back to you, um, as we said, as an update on our process that we started back in April um, to bring forward a parks and community facilities bylaw that outlines our um, general operations of our parks and facilities with inclusion with our um, uh, fee schedule. Um, <clears throat> so at our last meeting, we brought um, a couple um, topics for discussion um, to determine the criteria for setting fees in the future um, at our um, parks community facilities. Um, and we had um, went forward with the community comparison model for determining our fees, um, which at the time we had um, done a sample of our fee structure. So um, picked a few key areas. Um, and then going forward from there, we did a more fulsome examination of our entire fee structure using the um, community comparison model. And we indicated several areas where there's a very significant increase in the fees um, if we were to go forward with implementing these changes um, as they would go um, greater than 25% um, increase in the areas listed, including uh, some specific rental areas such as the youth rentals in our um, larger viewing area space, so the full space, um, as well as our rental items, which without um, many communities of renting individual items out, um, there was a um, commercial comparison done with other communities. Um, if we went in a commercial um, direction, then there would be a larger than 25% increase um, without um, other comparisons being available. Uh, another area with a significant increase is our arenas and dry pads, which um, there are um, several things we can do to mitigate some of those increases um, that um, listed below. Um, day camps as well were another area in which um, there was a bit of an increase or a bit of a higher increase in our seniors fitness um, as well, which was historically an area where we've um, kept low for um, attracting um, people to use the facilities. Uh, skiing classes with equipment was a fairly new um, program that we took on and that one was another area where um, there's a significant increase compared to other communities. Um, swimming lessons and especially private swimming lessons, uh, those were another area where we were um, quite a bit lower than other communities and family swimming memberships. Um, Conversely, we had some significant decreases in some areas, including our community hall rentals um, for commercial rates in particular, and our child and family climbing. Um, that one is more inclusive of our rules that we have for um, entering into the aquatic corridor, which was a secured area. Um, which past that point, there was you know, nothing to determine which um, activity we're going to do, either courts or climbing or swimming. Um, so the fees were inclusive of a swimming um, pass as well as a climbing or a court. Um, after examining that, that practice isn't necessarily um, fully um, utilized. So people aren't necessarily going climbing and then going swimming and then going to the courts and going swimming. And we have more history now to pull from for that. 
um, and our adult drop-in fitness and water fitness um, it was a little bit higher than other communities. So that would decrease um, with a community comparison and as well as our ball diamonds. Um, that was a fairly significant decrease um, compared to other communities. Um, so in pulling all this together, we have highlighted a few ways where we could mitigate the potential increases in these areas, um, including um, in some cases, um, excluding Fort St. John and Dawson Creek because they're larger communities, um, we'd be able to reduce that um, gap, um, particularly for the arenas that would make the highest impact there. In some cases, Fort St. John and Dawson Creek were the only, um, only comparison for some of our services, um, since some of the smaller communities don't have the same services um, that they would. Um, so it wouldn't be a fulsome, just disclude them across the board, um, but it would be um, something that we could look at for um, some of those um, higher level areas. Um, we could also look at setting base rates at our adult rate, um, which we could then apply um, percentage um, decreases um, in the fees for those ones that would be more consistent across a, all of our rental areas, such as our programs have several different categories. So we have teen, um, youth, child, senior, adult um, categories for most of our um, programs. And then for our facility rentals, we just have a youth, senior, and a adult. Um, in those cases, we could set a percentage comparison. So the adult rate would be what we would go to other communities for, and then we would take a percentage of that. Um, currently, if we looked at that for our um, fitness, we could set it at um, seniors fitness could remain at a 50% of an adult rate, which would keep us a little bit more um, online with what we're currently um, charging out. Um, and then another option um, is to disclude the um, commercial comparison for our facility rentals. Um, and um, we would look at more of a cost recovery or maintaining um, replacement cost for rental items. Um, and <clears throat> further to the arenas, um, we could look at a potential area to reduce the impact of the increases is to increase the difference between the two arenas, um, which would allow for um, more cost savings if we went with the secondary arena rentals, um, which would also be more inclusive of the lack of um, arena bleacher seating plus being the colder arena. Um, it would make sense to keep it at a greater disparity between the two rinks. And Um, so once we um, open that up to discussion, we would hope to bring some more of those um, um, to the fee schedule, which would go into the bylaw for when we bring it to council for adoption. And that would be... Um, hoping to take place later in um, the spring. Um, so it wouldn't take place immediately. 
at the beginning of the year, we would hope to roll that into one of our leisure guide um, rollouts. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mrs. Aspen? Councilor Penny. Um, actually not questions so much. <laughs> I, uh, I would don't really want to see us have any increases in fees unless absolutely necessary. Um, in discussions with, with visitors over the last little while and, and residents, everybody is so pleased with our facilities and the accessibility um, to every level of, of resident here. I wouldn't want to see it change unless it absolutely had to. Um, and just a couple of new residents I ran into this weekend were just so excited, I mean, about our facilities. And I can just imagine how hard it must be to compare us to any other community because uh, even thinking about that, our, that we might have higher rates for commercial community hall rentals and that sort of thing, after been in many other communities, I haven't seen anybody with facilities that even come close to comparing to ours. So I can imagine our rates would be comparable, you know, would be a little bit higher than, a, than your average community hall. but. As for uh, swimming and any of those activities that families take part in, until I see some prosperity take place in the Northern Rockies, I wouldn't want to see our fee schedule increase much at all. That's about all I have to say on the fees anyway. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Gerwin. So I think I'm probably a little bit out of step because I had missed the meeting in July where council voted to base the fees on the like community or the communities in the region. And so like I missed that meeting. So, I, you know, wasn't there. Um, so I just want to say, I know we all know this, but our reality is very different from our neighbors. And uh, they, they have a whole different economic happening there than we currently do now. So I believe that deciding a rate structure based on communities in the region has shown by what um, has just been presented tonight that, you know, it's going to mean increases and I'm not going to vote to support any rate increase unless there's a dire need to see that happen. And I believe if I remember correctly, a lot of work went into setting the original base rates back when the um, when we were setting those rates and we had to increase some of the swimming rates at that time, took away free seniors swimming. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we don't want to, you know, keep our own base rate. And then if that has to be in future um, adjusted based on cost of living or a different tax reality or something, but I really don't want to see the municipality um, consistently basing our rate structure on our communities in the region. And then I just wanted to address the, if I'm again remembering it correctly, the commercial rates were what they were because at the time council didn't want to um, compete with other businesses in town that were offering catering. And so that could be an explanation as to why that one is a little bit higher. So, yeah, thank you. That's a lot of work went into this report. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Roper. Uh, yeah, I feel very similar um, uh, to Councillor Gerwing and Councillor Penny. I, I, I wouldn't want to see um, any of our rates increase. And also uh, in the same uh, thought, I wouldn't want to see our rates decrease in other areas. Um, I think right now it's important to provide our uh, residents with, uh, with affordable options, um, especially right now uh, through COVID. So uh, yeah, I would not be in favor of any increases or decreases. Thank you, Councillor Roper. Councillor Souls, any comments? So I agree with, uh, with uh, what's been said here. I don't wanna see any increases either. And I think the reality in uh, Dawson Creek and Fort St. John is much, much different than it is here. There's much more competition for space uh, it, at their arenas than there is here. And I think this is one of the things that uh, we can use to attract people to our community is the lower rates at the rec center. So I don't wanna see any 
increases here either. Uh, and I think I agree with Councillor Roper. I don't want to see any decreases either at the moment. So that's where I'm sitting. So Councillor Gerwin. Yeah, and I do have like um, major contributions that I would like to contribute to the bylaw. It's all of my sticky notes there. So I don't know if we want to do that tonight or do we want to have this discussion at another time? Um, because yeah, I don't know. How do we want to handle the by the possible draft bylaw that was presented in this package? Um, well, in the if I mean you're welcome to to describe them, but we can also sit after um, later this week, or you can leave that with me, and we can integrate them for a future draft to come back to council instead of the next version coming back for readings. We could bring it back as another draft with what you've marked there integrated. Okay, I don't know if council. So I, I guess when you bring them back, there'd be an option here of the way it's drafted now versus the way that the amendments that Councillor uh, Goering wants. And has anybody else found any adjustments they would like to make to that bylaw? Councillor Penn. I have as well. I, I, I think they're very similar to Councillor Gerwing, so I, I'll probably take a look and, and add any of the other ones that I. Okay, if, Councillor Penny, if you could. Uh, provide those to uh, Mrs. McIver so that they could all be included in the same draft. That would be great. All right. So um, I think that provides direction that we're not going to increase or decrease any of the fees and that we're going to um, wait to bring back the bylaw at a future date with the amendments that the councillors have proposed. There's no objections, we'll move on. Administration report number 85, Royal Canadian Legion, Military Service Recognition Book or Decision. Mr. Barry, are you speaking to this? Sorry, I lost my way. Oh, Miss Pike, Miss Hanson, hello. Hello. Um, it's a short report. Um, basically, it's a, a redo of the last 12 years. I believe we've been, no, nine years that we've been contributing to the, um, the Legion BC Yukon Military Service Recognition Book. This year, the uh, price went up about $25. It was $325 last year, and it's up to $350 for the same um, color business card advertisement that we've done in the past. Um, there are other options available, and um, I just put in a couple of sort of the color ones that are on the lower price scale for council to consider. Thank you. Any comments, councillors? No, entertain a motion. Councillor Penny. Make a motion that we uh, take option one to continue with the business card disbursement. I'll second that. It's moved by Councillor Penny, seconded by Councillor Gerwing. All those in favor? That motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. Mrs. McIver, airport fees. Um, so, as Council will recall, over the course of COVID, you um, opted to amend your airport fees bylaw to um, basically remove the landing and in planning fees. This summer, <clears throat> um, your kind of uh, review period was up and you opted to reinstate those fees come the end of the year. So here we are. The bylaw is attached um, for your consideration that would uh, essentially reinstate the landing and in planning, passenger and planning fees for the Northern Rockies Regional Airport. Are there any comments? Councillor Gurring. Um, so when I compared the previous to the new ones, I, unless I maybe didn't see it, which it could be, but um, on the new one, it says a direct phone line, uh, the cost of $208.50. I'm just wondering, um, is that new? Can I have an explanation? Is that per phone line? Like, what is that going to mean for businesses operating there? So all it is is... If you've been in an airport, you have the phone that you pick up and call a cab yeah. or a hotel. Yeah. That is basically what that is. So if you're a hotel that wants a direct phone, someone can just pick it up and get your reception desk. 
So we should probably. Um, we can admit that apparently that service is no longer available at the airport, which didn't uh, get communicated. So oh, okay, so that will be was, removed. Yeah, it was. Okay. it was offered for many years. It was never in the bylaws. So we right. were essentially charging a fee without having the authority to charge the fee. Okay, so we gave ourselves the authority, but now no, now we don't have it. <laughs> Perfect. So. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> that was not a oh, yes. Are so, there any other comments? So if you'd like to uh you can give it readings with that amendment. So then it when, when it comes back with the doc uh, for adoption, that will be removed. Very well. So I'll make the motion of the airport fees amendment la uh, aircraft landing and passenger and planning by law number 199, 2021, be given first, second, and third reading with that amendment. Seconded by Councillor Gowen. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. Um, Northern Rockies Regional Hospital District, uh, 2022 Provisional Budget Adoption Bylaw number 76. Good evening. Mrs. Pike? Hello, Ms. Spike. How are you? Hello, I am well. Uh, Mayor and Council, every year at this time, we present to you a provisional budget for the hospital district. Um, timing is that uh, we require a budget going into 2022. Um, so that's the provisional budget. We have then the opportunity to finalize that budget before March 31st, once we're um, well into budget season, and we will provide, uh, generally provide an amended budget at that point in time. What we've done this year in the admin report, we've, um, we've separated out in our analysis the, the costs that relate to Northern Health, and then the costs that are directly attributed through um, the NRHD for operations, um, admin operations, and our own special projects. And with the admin report, we've also identified a reserve fund continuity schedule. We've recognized that there were projects that have been funded from the reserve fund. And in 2021 and in this budget 2022, in order to not have an increase in the tax levy, we're also pulling funds from the reserve fund to be able to maintain that balance. Um, on a good news uh, story, in the 2021 budget, there was a budgeted uh, expenditure for the ultrasound. The cost share to the municipality was budgeted at 41,000 and it has come in at 17, basically $18,000. So what they did was the total cost of the project was $118,000. They took their $100,000 grant directly off the top and uh, our contribution um, was directly impacted in a very positive way. Thank you. Are there any comments? Councilor Gerwing. Um, so are we going to be looking for a grant um, to cover offset um, the boiler project from our end? I know that Northern Health has got funding from some federal environmental something, which is why the boiler project came up um, without uh, much notice on our end. But I'm wondering if... Um, we can't be looking and continue to look for a grant that will cover our end of this. Uh, certainly we can look into it. The project is 75% complete and generally grant funds um, are not allocated once a project is undertaken, uh, but we, we can uh, shake the trees and see what we can find. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Very well. I'll call the question that the Northern Rockies Regional Hospital District 2022 provisional annual budget adoption bylaw number 76, 2021 be given three readings and adoption. Seconded by Councillor Penny. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Correspondence letter from Northern Health, Angela Smith, Chief Operating Officer, Northeast Healthcare Services in Fort Nelson. Are there any comments? Very well. Letter from Northern Lamplighters Activity Center Association, Val Keeler, Board Chair, request for a letter of support. Any comments? Councillor uh, Gerwin. I would make a motion to write a letter of support. Very well. Seconder, please, for that motion. Councillor Souls. All those in favor? Carried. Northern Rockies Regional Municipality letter to uh, Employment and Social Development Canada, support for Meals on Wheels program. Any comments on that? And the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality letter to the Honorable Catherine Conroy, Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Development, Old Growth Strategy Review in the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality. Any comments? Very well, thank you. Um, see for information, council information package, December 1st, 2021. Council information package, December 8th, 2021. Uh, new business items, Councillor Gerwing. Okay, thanks mayor. Um, so, I sent out an email previously so that you people would all have the information, uh, but I did have a resident that contacted me after our last meeting where we talked about um, sending a letter um, in support of the Peace River Regional Health Board District something <laughs> request for uh, an audit of Northern Health. And um, we had agreed to send a letter. Um, so this person contacted me and asked if um, council would entertain the notion of sending in a request, not a letter, because you can um, send in a request to the auditor general um, to have uh, an audit of Northern Health. So I uh, put together some information on the Auditor General. I don't know if you'd like me to share it now or if we are interested in um, entertaining a notion to uh, put in a request um, to the Auditor General for uh, an audit of Northern Health. Um, so Councilor Goering, why don't you share the information from the Auditor General about the Auditor General, just okay. for background for everybody? Thanks. Okay, so first I would just like to um, also point out that if our letter hasn't been written already, that this resident also requested that the letter come both from mayor and council and from the Northern Health Regional Hospital District. So although it's the same body of people on those two boards, it is two different boards. So that original letter that we had um, voted to send. Uh, the request would be that it also included the Northern Health Northern Health Regional Hospital District. So it, would that be okay with council if we did that? Sure. And if so, I would make a motion that reflects that. I'd second that. Okay. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, so I just did a really brief research into the BC Auditor General when the resident called me and um, it's a nonpartisan, independent of government and reports directly to the Legislative Assembly. The Officer of the Auditor General conducts audits, reports on how well government is managing its responsibility and resources and makes recommendations for continuous improvement. The office serves the people of BC and their elected representative and is responsible for auditing over 150 organizations that make up the government reporting entity, including ministries, 
crown corporations, university, colleges, school districts, and health organizations. These are organizations that are controlled or accountable to the provincial government. So interesting that the Office of the Auditor General engages in two types of audits. There's a financial audit and a performance audit. So both types of audits are carried out in accordance with the assurance standards of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants. So briefly, the performance audit reviews the wider management issues of an organization or program and whether it is achieving its objectives efficiently, economically, and efficiency. They are sometimes called value for money audits because they can advise whether there is value received for the money being spent. Performance audits span a variety of topics and sectors, including healthcare. Uh, financial audits are the majority of the office's activities. Financial audits usually state whether an organizational's financial statements are fairly presented and free of material misstatements, meaning significant errors. They also audit other financial information such as compliance with federal agreements. Couldn't find anywhere where, where it says that they will actually look at you know, how much money is coming into an organization and, and then how, if it's being spent um, to the best use of the dollars. I couldn't find that under the financial audits. And um, then there's just a little bit of information on how audit topics are chosen. The office regularly assesses the government's environment and ranks potential audit topics based on a combination of impact, so on dollars and people, urgency, and their capacity to do the work. The, um, to accommodate emerging priorities, uh, their work plan is reviewed and adjusted regularly. Um, they assess the interest of legislatures, MLAs, and the public in potential audit topics. And uh, they encourage us to send our suggestion. There's an, you can do it by letter, but there's also an online uh, portal that you can uh, put your request in there. Uh, yeah, so that's, that was my kind of brief research on what the Auditor General does. Oh, and I should add that um, the office has conducted many audits, as I stated earlier, um, but they include, they did an audit of the recruitment and retention of rural and remote nurse, nurses in Northern BC. So they audited Northern Health in 2018, and they made nine recommendations in terms of um, recruitment and retention. So if you're interested, go on the website because it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so they found that, um, well, I'll let you read the report because it's, yeah, there's some positives and not so many positives on recruitment and retention for North Indian. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that, Councillor Gurun. I think that's very informative and particularly the part about uh, Northern Health being audited for retention uh, retaining workers in uh, the North, because I think this is one of the most important things that face all the communities in the North. Um, the Resource Municipalities Coalition is drafting a letter, which I signed, and then it's gone back for a bit of a rework about the particular direction that the Resource Municipalities Coalition is going to take regarding um, requesting the government to do an audit of Northern Health. Uh, so this was just um, exactly what they were exactly what they were requesting to audit it was going to be massaged a little bit before they sent it off. Uh, I contacted the uh, head of uh, North Central Local Government Association, Corey Ramsey, and told her that uh, we would like to see that uh, audit of Northern Health put on the uh, agenda for. Uh, North Central Local Government Association the next time they meet. Um, I think we're, this is going to be an ongoing thing where they, the individual members of the North Central Local Government Association, the Resource Municipalities Coalition, are going to be looking at exactly what they want the government to audit. And I think the idea of getting the Auditor General um, uh, to audit uh, Northern Health is a good idea, and uh, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't uh, include them or write a separate letter to them either way, um, requesting an audit. So I will leave that there.
Uh, was there an emotion, Councillor Irving, that you wanted to make? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would absolutely make a motion um, that we uh, contact the Auditor General requesting a performance audit of Northern Health. Very well. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Roper. Seconded by Councillor Roper. All those in favor? That is carried. Uh, Councillor Gerwing, public communication, uh, Northwest Tell internet speeds. Right here on new business items. Oops, okay. Rec stats. I do have a question on the rec stats. Okay, Councillor Gerwing. <laughs> you must have oh. known that was going. Uh, so I was just uh, looking at the comparison under child minding year to date of 2021, it says um, 46 compared to year to date 2020 at 361. Are, are we accumulating statistics differently or why would there be that difference? <laughs> that might be okay. a, thank you. Yeah, might be a typo. Standing items for discussion, council reports. Are there any council reports? Council Gerwin. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so on November the 23rd, I attended the Northeast Coalition sponsored cluster development workshop. Uh, we went through what cluster development looks like and worked on what some might look like for this area. As the NRM has already done so much work on cluster development, the information and subsequent work was a good review, but not new. That said, we had a really good conversation on what cluster development might look like around a community's social services. So it was kind of a different slant. I attended the chamber board meeting on November the 25th and December the 9th. And as I reported earlier, the chamber will now be meeting twice a month and Additionally, once a month, they will have a general chamber meeting. So three meetings a month is what the chamber will be having. As the chamber liaison, um, that I, I will find that to be a bit much, uh, but the board is developing a policy and defining expectations for their council representative. And as that policy moves forward, I will keep you informed. And just a reminder that the chamber general meetings are open to any chamber member and we are all chamber members. So as council, if you wanted to go to the general meetings, you could do that. Um, the chamber applied for and received a grant of $51,000 to deliver a shop local initiative. So watch for um, details coming out. It's gonna be quick. It's like February turnaround for that. So there's some good things planned. Um, I attended the Community Health Plan Steering Committee December the 3rd. Uh, we received notification there that the boosters, the COVID boosters would be available mid-January, although um, that has changed and everybody, well, lots of people got not notified on Sunday that they're opening up now and I definitely got mine today. So if you need a booster, uh, you can call the health unit or book through the provincial online booking app. And um, lastly, on the community health planning is the referral numbers from the clinic are once again uh, available to committee members. And um, of note, in November, there were 100 referrals, including general or orthopedic surgeries. So these referral numbers are invaluable as we continue to work towards equitable access to health services. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gerwing. Also attended the uh, cluster development and I found it was good, but I think it was more oriented towards business. I didn't really see much uh, in the way of opportunities for municipalities to participate other than encouraging businesses to get together and look for synergies. Um, we attended the Resource Municipalities Coalition meeting in Fort St. John um, and discussions ensued around several topics, including the, um, uh, the current um, decision of um, the provincial court on um, the Blueberry um, decision. 
and uh, that was a major topic of discussion. Any other council reports? Councilor Penny. Uh, as a representative from the Rotary Club, I know most people have probably seen the stats come out in various places, but just wanted to bring a little bit of light to, um, there was a goal set by Rotary at the end of September to raise $50,000 towards the new CT scanner that we're gonna be asking for from Northern Health. And um, Dr. Mostert agreed to match dollar for dollar with Rotary uh, over the next two years is what the goal was set for. And just from their uh, rotary auction, they raised $43,300. There was additional cash donations, which the mayor would be privy to at least one of them, uh, for $24,000. And there's still a raffle in place right now, which will be drawn for before the new year, which is expected to bring in another ten dollars or $12,000. So a goal set for the next two years of $50,000 has been uh, met and exceeded by 30 percent uh within three months so i think that that goes to show great work done by rotary but it also goes to show how much the community is behind this initiative to get the ct scanner so something that we all need to keep in mind around this table when any more talks come up to northern health when in that respect next spring hopefully right. thank you absolutely thank you councillor penny for that yes i Councilor forgot Brewer. to turn the page i have one more thing. very well go ahead Sorry, I, I didn't want to go without telling you our great news on the Environmental Advisory Committee update. So I've met with Hillary um, twice. So she is going to be the staff liaison for the committee. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I met with Scott once. We've created a formation work plan. Um, we're working on the terms of reference. We already have a call out and have sent invitations to organizations identified in the report to council for committee participants and already have a few applications. And we anticipate that our first committee meeting will be in February. Thank you. Is there any virtual attendees who wish to ask any questions? Very well. I'll ask for a motion then to um, move to a closed meeting pursuant to section 90 C, A, E and L of the community charter. Moved by Councillor Penny, seconded by Councillor Souls. All those in favor? Carried. And we are in an in-camera meeting.